right, welcome. Lots of uh, familiar faces for me, so uh, this should be a lot of fun. So we're going to well, uh, you know, welcome Dr. Hurd and Dr. Hill, and you know, to talk about a subject that we've been dealing with in Michigan since 2008, at least from the medicalization side of things, and understand that this is not a topic that goes without you know a lot of realities. And my role is the. Uh, uh, medical staff chief of pain medicine for Spectrum Health, I have to be able to answer these questions for patients. And in my role as the, the president of the Michigan Society of Addiction Medicine, I have to answer the same questions and possibly in a different way, uh, depending on what it is. And I've had um, a friend of mine who passed away of rectal cancer who I actually helped uh, set up and smoke marijuana um, at his home. And I've also uh, told people that I, I would salt the earth so that they couldn't get a card because it was so destructive to their life. And I've spent thousands of hours trying to treat patients who have marijuana use disorder. So understanding that we have the, these two sides of an argument and understanding where it has to live somewhere in the middle and how we build laws around it and understand the science is what we're going to learn about next. And so I would ask that uh, you, you keep the, uh, the comments uh, to the very end uh, when we're going to have 15 to 20 minutes to have live questions. Please write down your questions, and I will do my best to cohort those and ask uh, the bigger picture ones so that we can have some overlapping answers. And without further ado, which is a rarity for me is brevity, um, I'm going to move on to our uh, first speaker, Dr. Kerr. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, already I'm, I'm enthused by the students, and I wave to them um, upstairs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges and opportunities in regards to medical marijuana, and I know that Kevin has some really intriguing, provocative clinical. Um, questions to bear on this subject. So I'm going to focus, because I just to split it, I'm going to focus a lot on the scientific um, data that we have from research that's done in my group and a few others. My disclosure is that a lot of the research I'm going to show you are from a really talented group of investigators in my, in my team, both basic scientists and um, clinical um, researchers. <coughs> and I will talk about um, one of the, the um, medications that I will talk about we're developing is from DW Pharmaceuticals. So I think our country has gone in you know, two different uh, directions. We started off with the reefer madness that the government in that prop uh, propaganda, in a way, in the 1920s and 30s. And then in the 1970s, the, the liberate marijuana movement started in really full force that today we see the huge tidal wave with the legalization that you have around the, the country. Um, this was from, I had it from last year, from 2015, that 23 states had, legal, had medical marijuana, um, and it's still the same today. But there are a number of states that are currently voting on different aspects of that, so this number is definitely going to change, I think, in 2016. The other information on this slide is not for you to read. It's the symptoms that marijuana is said to, to treat. So you will have things of a number of pain um, disorders are on here, but you will also have writer's cramp. Um, I think there was some menstruation cramp somewhere. You have some toenail disorder. I mean, the list is amazing. So if indeed marijuana can treat all of these symptoms, we absolutely have a miracle drug, and we should be, all of us, using it. So the question is, you know, is it a miracle drug or not? That's what science is trying to figure out. So there was a Time a cover article last year on our research in, in Time magazine, and they pointed out you know, that all this groundbreaking studies on these disorders, but I think that at the end of the day, they also realized that medical marijuana is outpacing the actual empirical evidence. And that is what I think that we need to talk about. So one of the challenges that we face with medical marijuana is that this is a a phytocannabinoids in this plant. They are, there's not just one cannabinoid in the plant. The plant contains over 400 chemicals, about 70 to 80 um, cannabinoids, and they have different um, degree of their um, pharmacological activity. And I'm not going to go into details about a lot of them. I'm going to emphasize perhaps two of them in particular. One, of course, is THC, which is the 
psychoactive component, wait, I pointed to the wrong one, the THC, the psychoactive component that is associated with the reward. And there are other cannabinoids such as cannabidiol that a number of us are studying in um, other aspects of countering some of the negative effects of, that we see in substance use. The THC um, and the, the liberalization of marijuana, as per se, and the increase of marijuana in our society led to a few things. One, in the cannabis plant over the past decades, um, the THC concentration in the marijuana on the streets has increased dramatically. So has, so the um, open line um, are the number of primary marijuana treatment admissions, the red line in terms of seizure potency, that seems to um, correlate to the amount of THC as, as increased in the plants. This is a, a very recent study that's done on the, the DEA captured um, marijuana plants and looking at THC and other cannabinoids actually in the plants for, from 1995. And you see again, over time, there is increase in the THC. And actually, this slide doesn't show it, but the type of strain of marijuana that is smoked today is actually the cincinilla um, strain that, that's growing in popularity as compared to another strain. And that the strain that's most common today has a much greater, higher concentration of THC. One of the things that these marijuana plants on the street today have um, not only higher THC, they have lower concentrations of cannabidiol. This cannabidiol um, has been shown to be neuroprotective or protective for certain um, aspects, and I'll come back to that. So the fact that the, 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 the plants on the street today have higher concentration of THC and lower concentration of cannabidiol um, is one of the reasons that people think, one, you're seeing more um, addictive related um, disorders and related psychiatric disorders and lower um, aspects of, well, I shouldn't say protective, protection, I'm gonna come back to it. So what is marijuana? As I said, I, it's made up of many cannabinoids. Um, the two, for example, THC and cannabidiol, they both mediate their effects at cannabinoid receptors. They're called CB1 is the most prominent um, receptor in the brain, I'm gonna show you that, and CB2. These cannabinoid receptors are all throughout our body. You have a lot of the cannabinoid receptors, the, the type one, CB1, in the brain, but it's also in the periphery. In addition, you, the CB2 receptors are, are highly um, expressed on the, in, in the immune system. So, and for me as a neuroscientist, we study a lot of the, the, the cannabinoids for their actions on regulating um, neurotransmission. And the reason is that these cannabinoid receptors, like I said, particular to the CB1 receptor, is located at the synapse where neurons and, and cells speak to each other. So they play a very strong role in regulating synaptic um, communication, transmission, synaptic plasticity. So this is um, a a picture of the cannabinoid receptor um, expressed throughout the human brain. And um, this is just, um, I wanna, these are coronal sections. So if you take slices of the brain in this manner um, and you look, you will see that the cannabinoid receptor is, like I said, throughout the brain. In fact, the cannabinoid receptor, the CB1 receptor, is the most abundant um, it's a t type of G protein receptor in our brain, the most abundant. And I can't, uh, to me it's not because for smoking marijuana, it's for regulating this tight, um, regu it's regulating these synaptic transmission and communication between cells. So we have it in parts of the brain and said the, this is the cortex, these groove-like areas, important for cognition. So is the hippocampus, this area right here for memory. The very highly expressed area here is the cerebellum, motor coordination and so on. So we know that it's, it's really important for uh, a number of functions in the brain. The cannabinoids, as I said, they work regulating the CB1 receptor, that's where they bind, but by doing that, they actually regulate our, our natural ca cannabinoid system. So basically, you know, THC, marijuana, the, the cannabinoids in there 
are, they kind of um, trick the brain and the body in, in believing that they are our own endogenous cannabinoids, so the endocannabinoid system. But they do it at a very high level, so it's super physiological. So as I said, the cannabinoid receptor that sits at the synapse that regulates um, transmission, how cells communicate, THC um, causes a much greater activation of these receptors and therefore really profoundly changes um, synaptic uh, function. So that's just like an overview of cannabis, our endocannabinoid system, that cannabis kind of um, take over that role. And so why is it a, an issue? And it's an issue in terms of what the effects of marijuana are on the brain. Uh, as a neuroscientist, we look at acute effects, long-term effects of the drug. Obviously, for recreational use, people take it because it makes them feel good, this euphoric effect. It also has impact on your memory, so short-term memory acutely. There is difficulty in thinking and solving problems. However, long-term use leads to the sleep impairments that we see, especially as we were talking about before with, um, during the withdrawal state. We also know, as I said, the long-term effects of this. And for us, why we study it in terms of the effects on addiction, that it, people can become dependent, um, it changes mood and anxiety, and this classic amotivational syn syndrome that you see. So the challenges of medical marijuana for us is that there are a number of um, issues of using a, a drug that is smoked in large part as a, as a medicinal uh, application because you have, and you have a very large variability between people so that smoking, for example, the smoking group, about two to six, 56 percent of it, you can see variability in terms of how much of that um, active ingredient really gets to the brain and the behaviors that it needs. But there are now changes in terms of sublingual sprays and vaporizers that might offer more accurate um, amounts of the drug going into the, into the body. Another thing that's a challenge for medical marijuana is that it's very lipophilic. So it's taken up by um, tissue, for example, you know, fat, it's released slowly. Um, and so those also make it very difficult at times as well. Um, when you're trying to study empirically whether a drug has medicinal value, you normally carry out clinical studies where you give one group of people um, the test medication and another group perhaps placebo or another drug that you know the actions of. The one problem with um, cannabis, when you say, okay, smoke this, it's very tough to give a placebo. So there's often this um, placebo bias that uh, many studies have found. So that's something, again, when you're trying to design your studies, how to think about in understanding uh, what, how we can learn about medical marijuana. So these are some of the challenges from my perspective of the research that we do. We're looking at aspects of addiction, the influence on the developing brain. We study what's the impact of, of marijuana during prenatal, adolescent exposure, and beyond. And as I said, the psychiatric risk that we see, and just the general health risk, but I'll let uh, Kevin talk more about that. <laughs> so we know that marijuana is the substance that is most um, teens and adults are dependent on in the US. It's funny, people always say to me, but you can't become dependent on marijuana. And um, that is not true. Just the clinical definitions, the DSM, the diagnostic criteria that they, uh, again, I'll let uh, Dr. Hill go through it, but we know that the, a large percentage of the population is dependent. And dependency on marijuana, or people, probably not surprising for many drugs, the more frequent you use it, the more likely is, it is that you're gonna become dependent. And these studies have show that about 10% uh, of the people who use cannabis um, become dependent, but it's 35% when they start using it, especially early um, uh, during the development. So as I said, our questions often are about the developing brain and the impact of THC. We know that the age of initiation um, of exposure to marijuana goes on to impact on who becomes dependent, and I said also the frequency. 
Um, and they go on to become dependent not only on cannabis, but the studies have shown, like I said, the earlier you use, you're even more sensitive to become, becoming dependent on other um, drugs. And for us, we study opiates so, um, in that regard. These are just other studies from other investigators just showing that, um, again, frequency of use of marijuana, um, whether as you go up to daily use, it increases your chances of becoming uh, cannabis dependent, but even um, with, say, in greater suicide risk um, in this particular study. This study is just showing that, again, the earlier cannabis use, the change in um, the thickness of the cortex, and especially when you have a genetic vulnerability associated with uh, schizophrenia. So there are a number of things that tell us about, um, in human um, studies, that potentially developmental exposure to marijuana might make people more vulnerable. So we use, animals, we use animal models to really start to give us some insights into whether or not um, this is really true. Because human subjects, you know, you can blame your parents, you can blame your friends, but the, the animals can't really do that. They can blame us because we're the ones giving them the drug. So we, we look at you know, I just showed you the studies that say that adolescent marijuana changes the cortical thickness, or does it really do that? We know that the prefrontal cortex is the last part of our brains to develop, and this part of the brain is really important for decision making, you know, higher cognitive function. So we give animals THC as adolescents, we let them grow into adulthood, and we study their behavior, and we study the, the, their molecular um, we studied their brains on many different levels. Just one study I'll show you, for example, we studied their prefrontal cortex. We actually studied the, the cells in the cortex that are important for, um, uh, I shouldn't say, every cell is important for communication. Um, I'm trying to this, this, uh, define a pyramidal neurons. But these are some of the prime cortex, um, cells in the cortex. And when you look at how the size of these um, cells in the prefrontal cortex, in a, in, um, when they became young adults, there really was no difference in animals that had um, adolescent THC exposure. However, there was a difference in the complexity of the cells. So the complexity of the cells in the prefrontal cortex in the young adults who had adolescent exposure to marijuana, the black line is what your normal development should look like in this part of your pyramidal cells. The green line is just showing the difference from that. And you can see that this is looking at how complex your pyramidal cells, the more complex, the more they're communicating. So you make these branches. And so they have fewer branches. There's, a f um, there's reduced complexity with, in adults with the uh, adolescent exposure. So we can say that we know from our studies that adolescent exposure alters the structural development of this prefrontal cortical area um, in the brain. There's oops, one thing about um, cannabis that we see often is that not that not every individual that smokes marijuana becomes dependent or show certain psychiatric pathology or other diseases, I should say. And so for us, we also are looking at what's the aspect about vulnerability. Why are some people more vulnerable? I'm just showing you two of them, and they both relate to genetics. So a classic study that was done, not by us, looking at cannabis and, and genetic vulnerability depended on the age of use. So those individuals who started using cannabis earlier and had um, a variant of an enzyme that metabolized one of their transmitters, dopamine, for example, those individuals were more likely to show um, schizophreniform disorders when they became adults. So it's just this genetic risk, but it was associated with early cannabis. We also found similarly that genetics played a role in who became cannabis dependent. Many people, as I said, smoke marijuana and do not go on to have a problem. But when you look at who became a dependent, there was a genetic association, so there was a nearly a ninefold um, increased risk of becoming cannabis de dependent depending on this genetic variant. And, um, if, and they it also associated with their um, negative affective traits. So behavioral traits we see definitely plays a role in how cannabis will affect one group of individuals to 
be more sensitive to the rewarding effect of a drug or not. And those are things that we're studying, trying to understand the individual differences because it, it's, it definitely um, is different for different people. So uh, uh, one of the final things in our preclinical studies was we see that actually prenatal and adolescent exposure to THC in certain behavioral traits can enhance addiction risk in adulthood and different behaviors. And so a question I had for one of the students and then a postdoc in my group was, does it have any effect on the next generation? And so we started looking at the germline effects of THC. And because, again, we use animals, we can take away the whole thing of how they're raised, which environment they're raised in, because we control their lives. So we expose them to THC when they're adolescents. We let them grow up. They fall in love. They have kids. But we have somebody else raise their kids, just to make sure that, that the maternal care and all of that is not part of the equation. And then we study their offspring for different generations just to see whether or not their parents' exposure to THC when they were teens, does it impact them? And it's, oh, it's missing a slide. I, I, okay. Um, a slide I was missing is it shows that the adult animals that um, their parents had THC exposure, they self-administered more heroin even though they had never been exposed themselves to THC pretty much, and showed other behaviors as well, again, even though they didn't have the direct effect of it. We also looked at molecular changes in these animals, and one of the things that we see is that we see molecular changes at the level of the synapse, and a lot of these genes have been implicated in a number of psychiatric disorders. Again, these animals themselves did not get the direct exposure, but they were adults of the animals who, um, in a way, you could say for the eggs were still in their mothers, even though their mothers were not pregnant and they, they weren't directly exposed. So true transgenerational effects is what you see in the grandkids and great-grandkids. So we follow the generations and look at the F3, the great-grandkids. They have never been exposed ever to THC, yet still you see that these animals, when they're given exposure to a reward, the first day, they're much more sensitive to self-administer this rewarding um, uh, substances and show greater motivation to obtain it. So there's a behavioral um, change that goes along the germline. We don't know the mechanism. We're trying to understand the mechanism of it. But so we see that the developmental effects of THC are not just there during your lifetime. They really do go across generations. So finally. I've said a couple of things about, and sometimes people get shocked, like, oh no, what did I do as a teenager that my grandkids, uh, don't worry, we can answer questions about that after, what, what do you think might happen to your grandkids? But, you know, we've been studying THC. So a lot of researchers, when we talk about cannabis, most researchers, if you look at the papers, are studying THC. They're not studying the full gamut of the, you know, nearly 70 to 80 cannabinoids in the plant. As I showed you earlier, one of the, the other cannabinoids, cannabidiol, used to be in higher concentrations than it is today. And so we started studying it. And to our surprise, I'm going to show people had shown that in, while THC increases psychosis and anxiety, that cannabidiol decreased it. So we started to study it in our animal models. So when you give THC to adolescents, animals and you study them in adulthood, I told you before, they live in self-administered heroin more than animals, normal animals. So we looked at what does cannabidiol do? And surprisingly, it actually inhibited um, heroin-seeking behavior, heroin-taking behavior, especially um, you can show animals uh, a cue in their environment that they know that heroin is coming. And if you show them that cue, even when they don't get the drug, they start pressing away trying to get the heroin. So it was the Q, cannabidiol decreases this Q-induced heroin-seeking behavior. So we decided to test it in humans. So we're doing all these studies in rats. We have an idea a little bit well, that how cannabidiol might be working, but we, didn't, we haven't figured out the mechanism why it's having this effect in, in rats, but we wanted to see does it work in humans. So we have done 
Um, this is in the early phases of our clinical studies, but if you give cannabidiol to heroin-dependent um, individuals, they're abstinent. We found just like our rats, it decreases the normal um, craving if you show them a, a video, heroin cues. It also decreased their anxiety induced by these, these cues. And it lasted, in our animals I didn't tell you, it lasts for a few weeks after the last cannabidiol injection. We see similarly in our human opiate addicts that the decreasing of their craving by cannabidiol. So their cannabidiol to me shows a promise. So there are some challenges with, with um, some aspect of THC, but cannabidiol definitely shows promise of some medicinal value. So I'm gonna just conclude um, about some of the considerations that I think are important when we think about medical marijuana. As I said, there are different components. There are different cannabinoids in the plant. So if you're going to have something medicinal, you have to know what you're giving the subjects and for which, which symptoms and which of these cannabinoids will be more effective. As I showed you, and I didn't give you the whole gamut of the things that we kind of know, there are individual differences in the response to, to marijuana. Absolutely. Some of it we see relates to um, genetics, their behavioral traits, the earlier exposure to marijuana, to THC at least, or not. The developing brain is particularly vulnerable to, um, to the exposure to THC. And we definitely need to have more research in order to um, achieve this goal, this hope of medical marijuana. So I'm proposing for evidence, more evidence-based um, research. Uh, we definitely need to reduce the federal um, compli complications of trying to work with um, marijuana for research. I've been able to do it. It's been jumping through a lot of hoops. But other colleagues, it takes two years just to be able to get a license to be able to study this. So I think that there are things that our legal system can do to help researchers really um, study cannabinoids. And just the policies and so on, we need to have a more balanced uh, assessment of medical marijuana. There is now a very big utopia-like push for marijuana can cure everything, yet still the evidence is, isn't really there. But it might be there if there are really structured research that's being done. Um, and in terms of a, a very big thing is, you know, there are state-to-state -state differences. We need to have national policies for what are the, the, the uniform use of, of medical marijuana. I, I think having a state-to-state is going to be very challenging. I think as we as a country get to understand more the promise of certain cannabinoids or aspects of medical marijuana, we'll be able to really say, for this symptom, this, for that symptom, that. But it, it, to me, it's tough to have that on a state-to-state -state level. So with that, I will pass it over to Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Hurd. So uh, Dr. Hurd set it up quite nicely. I'd just like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. It's great to be in Grand Rapids. Also wanted to thank the DeVos Foundation and Dr. Tomatis for inviting me as well. So we're going to cover a lot of ground in about 30 minutes or so. You've got my contact information there. I think we're going to cover most of, if not all, the questions that you have tonight. So if things do come up down the road, feel free to use me as a resource. You've got my website, my Twitter address. I think really the, the Twitter address underscores sort of the mission in what I try to do in educating people because as we'll hear uh, tonight and, and also in other times when you hear about marijuana, the loudest voices in the debate are often ones that have political agendas. And I think at times both sides have been guilty of spinning the data, of distorting the evidence. And so what I try to do on Twitter and what we're going to try to do tonight is to really present things from an evidence-based perspective. Where are the answers? And so for medical marijuana, where's the evidence? Where are there conditions for which there are no evidence, right? And a lot of times, the answers with marijuana aren't what we think, which is why, as Dr. Hurd pointed out, we need more research here, and it's critical. So there are things that we can do from a policy perspective and also from a clinical perspective to really take a better look at this complicated issue. In terms of my disclosures, I'm uh, primarily funded by uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, but also some other foundations. I have a book on marijuana. If anything I say tonight makes any sense and you want to do a deeper dive, feel free to check that out. 
Um, you have uh, my bio in, in the uh, packets. It's a lengthy bio. When I asked my mother to write that, I told her to keep it short. <laughs> But uh, it, I think it is also important, though, to point out that I'm a clinician first and foremost. So I see patients who have marijuana problems in a variety of settings. And so I teach younger doctors how to deal with addictions at McLean Hospital, where I work. We have specialty units in just about everything you can imagine. So anytime somebody has addiction issues on top of an eating disorder, a psychosis, uh, whatever the case may be, we go and see those patients there. And uh, as you may know, if you're a sports fan, you know that Addiction issues are ubiquitous in sports, and so uh, I have a modest athletic background, and so I still do a lot of work with um, some various teams and leagues in that area as well. The second bullet is really the focus of my work. I'm primarily, uh, like I said, a funded researcher, and I have three clinical trials that are ongoing now, two of which are aimed at developing treatments for that subset of people who are addicted to marijuana. So as Dr. Hurd mentioned, most people who use marijuana don't become addicted. It's about 9% of adults. It's about one in six of young people. But the trick is, especially with young people, is if I have 15 or if I have six 15 year old kids using marijuana and only one of them will go on to develop addiction, I can't predict which one of those six it's going to be, which is why, as much as we're going to talk about policy and how to do these things the right way tonight, I think the message needs to be loud and clear, particularly with young people whose brains are developing, as Dr. Hurd talked about. So the message needs to be clear there. Marijuana use is a very high risk proposition for those folks. And then the last bullet is really what we're doing here tonight, trying to bridge the gap. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of misinformation about marijuana, and we need to bridge that gap between what the science says and what public perception is. I think you probably have certain ideas about marijuana, what you may have heard or seen on TV. A lot of it's not true, unfortunately. And so I try to educate kids on this issue. I do a lot of work with the Boston Public Schools. We have an ambitious goal of getting in front of all 9th and 10th graders in the 33 Boston Public Schools. I'll be there tomorrow doing that. And, and then again, policymakers, so people that are actually making policy. We'll talk about what good policy could look like today. And so I try to do that in, in many states that are looking at these issues. Like Dr. Hurd mentioned, we've got 23 states in the district that have medical marijuana. We've got four states in the district that have legalized recreational marijuana. So this is a critical time where we really need to get the policies right. So clearly, when you think about policy, in the United States, there's been a trend towards increased access. Not necessarily increased use, because use is going up regardless of the policies, and that's some of the surprising data that we've seen. But people want to have access to it. If you have a medical condition, you think cannabis may be helpful, you want to be able to get marijuana to treat that medical condition. If you feel like you should be able to use it recreationally, then you want to have the ability to do that without any type of legal ramifications. So that's where the trend has been. However, I think we need to look at the difference between ideas and implementation. So I have friends on both sides of all these issues, and I think you can make great arguments, and we'll talk about the pros and cons of medical marijuana, and I'm sure in the Q&A we'll talk about legalization as well. So you can make strong arguments on either side of those issues. But what I think is less debatable is this idea that in the many states that have these policies, implementation has been poor. And that's being kind, okay? We'll talk about that. And, and what we're talking about with poor policies. So let's look at the policies, and really there's three stages, and we'll look at them through the lens of my state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, because we've had uh, the, the opportunity to really look at all three. And so where most of these things start is with decriminalization. Decriminalization, the idea that small amounts of marijuana sh for personal use should be allowed, right? So I agree with that idea. But again, when we think about implementation, we see how Massachusetts is going awry. And again, no offense if there's uh, politicians in the audience or people watching out uh, online. The reality is these are very busy people. And when people are making policies and they say, well, these other states have decriminalization, they often look at what other people are doing. They're looking at other people's work. And so there's a lot of copying that goes on. And so what happens is, unfortunately, a lot of times these policies perpetuate major, major issues. So as you see here, this is an ounce of marijuana. So one of the core themes in my book and when I talk about marijuana is a lot of things about marijuana are not intuitive. To me, an ounce of something is a small amount, right? We've got ounces of fluid in front of many of you. But when you think about an ounce of a dried plant product, cannabis in this case, it's a lot, right? So people use marijuana in all different forms, but we all know what a joint is and what that looks like. According to the World Health Organization, a typical joint 
is a half a gram to a gram. Anybody know how many grams in an ounce? 28. And again, I always like to say that I wouldn't know that if I didn't do this all the time. So 28 and a half grams in an ounce. So if we're doing the math, half a gram to a gram, an ounce of marijuana is 50 plus joints. Okay, so when I can reach this slide, I can't do it today, I'm not that tall. But if you block out a, a quarter of that and I say, well, if you catch me walking around with three quarters of an ounce of marijuana, is that personal use? 40 plus joints? Probably not, right? Unless I just bought. So most of the time, you catch me walking around with three quarters of an ounce, it's not personal use. So I think that's the problem with this type of law, right? I think that the spirit of this law would be better met with a lower limit. Let's say a quarter of an ounce. Let's say a half of an ounce. But unfortunately, somebody got the ball rolling with one ounce in state after state and city after city continues to do that. There are a few exceptions, but if you look at these policies, the overwhelming majority do it at one ounce. And I think that's unfortunate, right? So that's the difference between and a good idea, perhaps, a lot of people agree with decriminalization and really poor implementation, unfortunately. Medical marijuana, the focus of this talk, we're going to take a deeper dive into medical marijuana. But when we voted on medical marijuana in Massachusetts, which is a blue state, quite liberal, we voted for it overwhelmingly, 6337, which to me underscores the importance of getting the next step right, legalized recreational marijuana. So we're going to vote on this in November. And so as I've been saying, in our state and states like ours, the real question is not whether or not a particular politician is in favor of legalization or not. The question is, particularly in states like mine, where you're probably going to have this, the real question is, if it gets voted in, what should the policy look like? And personally, I believe that you should be thinking about policies that give people what they want, because they're going to vote for this anyway while mitigating risk, limiting the risk. And there are considerable risks here, clearly. So that's what we need to think about. Uh, so, but let's focus on medical marijuana, right? This cartoon here are some of the responses there, the typical response when you think about this idea. You see this guy here doing a double take. Something about medical marijuana doesn't seem quite right for most of us. Got to think about that. And as a result, physicians or other uh, mental health providers or, or health care providers in general are very, very suspicious of medical marijuana. And I understand why. We'll talk about that. So where does the science stand with medical marijuana? Because that's the key, right? I think this is relatively simple if you think about which conditions have evidence, which do not. So I published a paper in JAMA last year where we really looked at that particular issue, among others. But really what it boils down to is where is there evidence? There needs to be more research of course, and rescheduling would help. I don't think that's a, much of a debate. I think the idea that marijuana is a Schedule I substance, uh, you know, I don't agree with that idea, and we could talk about that further, but where does the evidence stand at this point? To think about this, we need to understand what's in place now. We have two FDA-approved cannabinoids, dronabinol, marinol, you may have heard of before, it's essentially just THC, and then nabilone or sesamet, which is a cannabinoid agonist, provides some of the same effects. Uh, that marijuana might. And they're FDA approved for two things. Number one, nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. Number two, appetite stimulation in certain wasting conditions like HIV. So if you think you need medical marijuana for one of those conditions, then a legitimate question is, have you had a trial of one of the two FDA approved cannabinoids? But importantly, and this is where I think my own thoughts have evolved over the years, is that you need to open up your your mind to this idea that for a given medical condition, aside from these, marijuana might outperform the limited cannabinoids that we have. Only two right now. There are more on the way. And when those come in, the landscape will change. But at this point, with only two available, as Dr. Hurd mentioned, 70 cannabinoids, the entourage effect, having those chemicals, CBD, for example, which is very promising, having more might be better than just having one or two for a given condition. So you need to keep in mind that that's a possibility. And that's why, to me, there is a place for medical marijuana. However, it's quite limited. So let's talk about medical indications according to the laws. And so if you pay attention to the title of the slide, you may see that, you know, foreshadowing a bit, that we're going to talk about the difference between what the laws say and what the science says. And I think that's a very dangerous place to be when there's that gap. 
but we're there. Massachusetts, we talk about debilitating conditions, but the second bullet shows, again, there's not a lot of creativity in some of these policies. We talk about the same conditions in state after state. And these are really serious illnesses, right? We don't want to downplay that. Cancer, glaucoma, hepatitis, on and on, really serious medical conditions. For some of those conditions, there's good evidence. Some, there's not, right? So glaucoma is a great example. It's one of the poster children of, of conditions for which people talk about medical cannabis. And it is true, marijuana lowers interocular pressure that's associated with glaucoma. However, there are many treatments that work pretty well for glaucoma. So usually there aren't ophthalmologists in the crowd, but if there was, I would bet that they would say, you know what, I don't think about using cannabis to treat glaucoma. In fact, if you went onto the website, if you've got your phone with you, American Glaucoma Research Foundation, they'll tell you flat out, don't do this, not a good idea. We've got treatments that work. This is a high risk medication. But unfortunately, although there's no evidence, no clinical trials to support cannabis for glaucoma, it just continues to happen state after state that we have people writing these laws with conditions that just don't have evidence. Beyond that though, we have to understand a couple of things that although there definitely are people who want to use medical marijuana for the right reasons, they have a very serious condition like these, for example, they want to have a treatment that works. They may have tried first line, second line treatments. Because I'm never saying that medical marijuana is going to be a first line treatment. But if they've done the first line, second line, they're working with their doctor. Again, not somebody who's uh, running a clinic and just cranking out certifications all day. There is a place for that. However, two things. Number one, you got people who have other conditions. So regulations in various states that are beyond the debilitating conditions that we're talking about or people who want to use medical marijuana really recreationally. So if you're in Colorado, the tax rate for medical is lower, so it's cheaper, you, know, you might want to do that, that sort of thing. So those are the problems that we're talking about. According to the science, it's important to note that, again, we should reschedule cannabis, but there are a fair number of trials already for cannabinoids or cannabis itself. And then the other piece, which gets a little bit complex, is this idea that you have to get to a certain point to even have a clinical trial, right? So sometimes somebody might say, look, there's been no trial of cannabis for condition X. And that may be true, but there might have been trials of looking at cannabis in an animal model, let's say, that really showed no signal, no effect. And so good luck taking that kind of result and trying to get funding, right? I mean, think about it. Why would they, the government, where money's always tight, why would they give you millions of dollars to look at cannabis in a medical condition for which there's no preclinical work, there may not be human lab studies that show positive results. So again, I think there need to be more research, uh, more research on the topic, but there have been a considerable number of studies already. The second bullet here is really an important take home point. This is where I think the evidence is best for medical marijuana, aside from the two FDA indications we talked about before. So three things, chronic pain, which is hard to measure, obviously, and I'm acknowledging that. Neuropathic pain, which is a burning sensation that people get in their nerves with certain neurologic conditions. And then uh, spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis. So when I say good evidence, I'm talking about multiple positive randomized controlled trials in humans, thinking about what you would need to get an FDA indication. So as a psychiatrist, I know that you don't need a raft of evidence to get an FDA indication. So we have plenty of Medicines, I don't want to name them, but they don't really have great evidence and they still got FDA indications. So there are new cannabinoids that are on the way and I think within the next three to five years we'll have at least one, probably more, for one or more of these conditions because these conditions have multiple positive RCTs, randomized controlled trials. Six for chronic pain, about 300 patients, the same is true for neuropathic pain. Then spasticity with MS, 12 trials, over 1,000 patients, so that's pretty good evidence in my view. Importantly though, beyond that, the data either doesn't exist or it's negative. So that kind of muddies the water a bit when thinking about these laws. As a result of that, I think most physicians don't want to get involved with this. So Herb Cleavers from Columbia, Robert DuPont also, these are two leaders in the field. They wrote a nice, succinct review paper in one of the top psychiatric journals a few years ago where they talked about the challenges that physicians face when thinking about certifying. So again, you're not prescribing marijuana. You can't prescribe an illegal substance. But certifying people for 
medical marijuana challenges. What are you actually getting contamination-wise? How do you know? How do we dose? Things like that. In my paper, we try to talk about some of these issues, but there are many, many challenges, and that's why certainly at this point, most docs don't want to get involved, right? They say, number one, not a lot of evidence. Number two, what about my license, right? If I'm certifying somebody to use an illegal substance, what, what happens if the DEA comes knocking? What's going to happen there? So those are major issues. And those are ethical questions as well, right? If, is this a treatment for somebody, but I'm worried about my license? Here, should I be doing this? That sort of thing. But again, most major medical organizations don't want to do this. It's another resource for you. It's a paper I wrote in Journal of Psychiatric Practice. came out a couple of years ago talking about some of the issues we'll talk about today, like, uh, again, what do you do as a physician? How do you have that kind of conversation? But there's other issues that we're probably not going to get to. What if you're a family practitioner and a patient shows up and they're already on medical cannabis and you may not believe in it? You may not want to sign on to that. What do you do? Can you tell them to go somewhere else? That kind of thing. So there are a lot of issues that uh, clinicians face. This is an ad that I took from my hometown paper not very long ago, a couple months ago, less than that. And again, you can't see it very well, but I'll tell you about it. It talks about, do you need medical marijuana? And again, there's a website, marymed420.com, not engendering a lot of legitimacy, I think. But they also say that they'll come out to you and do this for you in an evaluation that takes 20 minutes. So either they're really, really good, or they're doing something different than I do. Because when I evaluate somebody for a medical condition or a psychiatric condition or addiction, I mean, my evaluation takes at least an hour, sometimes more. And I know time is hard to come by in today's healthcare, but 20 minutes is not enough. And so, again, I know that there are I have friends of mine who have medical marijuana practices and things they're interested, they're advocates for that sort of thing. And I, again, I think they're trying to do it the right way. But this type of ad is what's out there now. And that, I know that's happened in Michigan, too, talking with, uh, physicians here. This really discredits the whole idea, right? You're taking a step back when people are putting this kind of ad in the paper. So, that, you know, these are people that are cranking out certifications all day long. And I gave a talk yesterday in Ohio, and questions were, you know, talking about these type of uh, practices where they're just writing certifications all day. And I said, well, what would you think of me if I saw 30 patients a day and I gave every one of them Prozac? Would you think I'm good? Right? So that's part of the issue there with these clinics. I think that, and we'll talk about this, who should be writing certifications? I'll talk about that. Great state of Michigan, you guys have had medical marijuana for quite a while, eight plus years. You limit the use of medical cannabis to debilitating conditions. There are quite a few of them, obviously, but it seems like in looking at the data, most people are falling under that chronic pain area. But you know, to the credit of the regulations, at least there isn't this other piece that we're going to talk about where you can just write for anything you want. No dispensaries yet. I guess they're on the way. But this is all very relevant for Michigan because you guys have had this. You're thinking about doing it. And it sounds like the early regulations weren't as good as a lot of people would have liked. And so they've been catching up in many ways, trying to rewrite them and rewrite them. And so you have to do that to some degree. But it would be great if we could get it right uh, earlier than later. What are the top three issues with medical marijuana regulations, again, using Massachusetts as an example. I think the first one is the quantities that these laws talk about, right? So you saw before what an ounce of marijuana looks like. In Massachusetts, 60 day supply, recommended 60 day supply, 10 ounces. So an ounce is a lot, 50 plus joints, 10, 10 ounces, what could you be doing with that? Right, and this big paragraph in the middle, you don't have to read it, what it says is that, you know, as the Omniscient physician, if I want to give them more, go ahead. Just got to just write a reason for that. So that's a major problem, right? I don't think that it has to be that way. You could have, and again, you know, I know that there are certain preparations of cannabis that you might require more if you're making a tincture and that sort of thing. But you could start with a lower limit and then say, well, if you're going to do something that requires more, then there's an exception. Another piece is when you think about how much marijuana people use in reality, it's worth thinking about. If somebody's a daily user of marijuana, the lowest amount they're going to go through in a week is about an eighth of an ounce, generally speaking. Quarter, pretty decent. Half, pretty serious. So again, people in my studies, people who are addicted to marijuana, 
two ounces or so per month. So there's 60 day supply, four ounces. So the 10 is a problem, right? It's hard to know. I would guess, you know, having talked to people in the process who did this, and there are a few states that have even larger limits, uh, like 24 ounces and things. So I think that Massachusetts was trying to find a, a middle ground, and they did, but I don't think it was uh, great, unfortunately. Second piece is the indications, right? We've talked about this. Where is there evidence? Where is there not? Uh, debilitating conditions, really serious issues, obviously, where Massachusetts sort of gave a back door to clinicians is by writing in the provision that you can have any condition as long, you know, the physician determines that this condition requires medical cannabis, then go ahead. And so as a result of that, we've had 25,000 certifications in about three years, 22,000 of them, of the 25, are for the other condition. So again, that's not what we're looking for. What, what could you do to limit that? And again, this is an old slide for me because I've been talking about this since before we voted on it. But the idea of a prior authorization, a prior authorization is a dirty word for some of you probably. But what that does, if I want to prescribe the latest and greatest medication for somebody, I have to, and my insurance company doesn't want to pay for it, of course, I have to file a, a prior authorization, prior approval. And it, what that does is it changes prescribing behavior. Again, if you think about this, if I have to see a whole bunch of patients in one day, and I'm thinking, okay, that's a bunch of PAs that I have to do, and maybe I have some help or not, it's going to change my behavior. And this could have the same type of effect, right? You could say if you have one of those eight debilitating conditions in Massachusetts, you got a green light. Beyond that, you got to file some paperwork. That would make it more likely that the people who really need it get it. But that hasn't been done yet. The last top issue, again, there are many issues, but the top issues, this idea of financial incentives. So in Massachusetts, we have six dispensaries three years in. So not a lot. But even with dispensaries, people who don't have a lot of money, who are living around the poverty line, in, in our state, the Medicaid patients are on mass health, they have a hardship uh, criteria where they can grow their own. And so when you think about that, what are the, the consequences there? So let's take a look at this. Again, this is, used to be a hypothetical scenario, but it's not anymore because we've had medical marijuana in Massachusetts for three years. Mr. A is a patient who is on mass health. He gets a card to treat migraines, already uses a quarter a week, two ounces per 60 days. But again, a typical high-grade ounce of marijuana goes for three, $400 typically. So if you're somebody that doesn't have access to a lot of money, but now you have a chance to use all that you're going to use, two ounces, and then sell another eight ounces, right? You can see what's going to happen. And that's, I mean, it is happening in our state and other states too. So now you're actually increasing the black market in some ways. You're, you're allowing some people to get in. They say, look, well, if I have this opportunity to make some money, I'm going to do it. So that's a, a, an unfortunate consequence of laws that might have been written a little better. In terms of ethical challenges, beyond which we've already talked about, there are many questions. Are our patients good candidates for medical marijuana? Right? So there's the issue of what you believe about it. You, know, you may not agree with it at all, but then beyond that, are your patients really good candidates? Psychiatric patients, probably not good candidates, right? There's no, we didn't talk about any uh, mental health issues for which there's data. There are some that people talk about. You know, we could talk about PTSD, for example another condition like glaucoma that continues to show up in state after state, but there's no evidence to support the use of medical cannabis for it. Ultimately, cannabidiol seems like a good candidate. So there are pieces of marijuana, certain cannabinoids that may be helpful for anxiety disorders like PTSD, but at this point, at this stage, paper came out last year, 2015, by a group at Yale, over 1,000 VA patients that have PTSD worsening PTSD symptoms, worsening functional outcomes. So not a lot of data there. And again, I think you should have the data before thousands of people start using any medication, let alone cannabis. So to me, again, the right way to do this is to have the person treating the debilitating condition write that certification. So not somebody who's in a clinic seeing people all day. When will the follow-up occur? Who knows? 
There's all of this talk in Michigan and other states about a bona fide doctor-patient relationship, but what is that? Right? You could go a step further and say, well, this is how often they need to follow up. But many states have been reticent to do that, unfortunately. So I think the oncologist, the neurologist, the specialist, or the family doc who's treating that debilitating condition should be the one writing the certification. The legalities of it, I know there are some lawyers out there, they're everywhere. Some out there, of course. I can say that my, my little brother's a, a lawyer, too. Um, so you have certain duties, right? You've got to render quality of care. But, but again, if you're certifying somebody for medical cannabis, and something goes wrong, this is not, you know, you don't have the FDA to hide behind, you know, in this case, right? There's not as much data. It doesn't have an FDA approval. So what does that mean? Where are you going to be if this... Again, like this leap of faith that jurors may take uh, for medical cannabis. Thinking about the second bullet, thinking about what the other options are. So if somebody co may come in and say, look, I need this medical marijuana, but there could be other options. So how comfortable are you talking about those other options? Do you know what the data is for them? And are you willing to have that conversation? What if they, again, say, well, look, I saw this on TV. I've got to have this. Are you going to be able to have a meaningful conversation with them and disagree, perhaps. And then the idea of meeting the standard of care. Again, a lot of people, just as they might come in looking for the purple pill, they make up their mind. They say, look, I have this condition. I want this treatment. And that's hard because in this day and age, you know, customer service is important and reviews and things like that. You know, people, there are all these websites where Again, you might see a lot of patients, so how long is it going to be for me to really have a conversation where I might make somebody angry or they might not like me as much, they might write a bad review, that sort of thing. These are all issues that you have to deal with, unfortunately, with medical marijuana. Again, this idea of informed consent. So like it or not, whether you believe in medical cannabis or not, it's a high-risk medication, significant potential side effects. THC does a lot of things, right? On the flip side, you know, it obviously can make you high, but it also can make you psychotic. And again, we've talked at length about certain impacts of chronic use, cognitive effects, worsening anxiety, worsening depression. Could you make perhaps even more likely to uh, develop a psychotic illness? So you have to have that conversation with the patient so they're fully aware of the risks and benefits. And you have to document it as well. So there's a bunch of additional steps that you need to take. And again, this idea about what could happen, we really don't have the long-term data that we do have for some conditions or for some medications, excuse me. So again, there are some medications that we're still learning about, but others have a lot more data. And then this idea about the third party, right? You need to protect somebody else. What is this going to mean? Somebody's using this, I'm saying, okay, you should use this medication, but are they going to be able to drive like they should be able to drive. What is it going to mean for them taking care of their children? That sort of thing. So there are a lot of issues here, and you don't have the firm legal standing or the scientific standing that you would like to have when you're taking these risks. Do you have a duty to report as a doctor, as a healthcare professional? Should you tell somebody about these medical marijuana mills that, that take place? You know, somebody shows up and sits in a hotel room and write certifications or they're going out like this Mary Med 420. No duty to report there, but maybe you should. It's hard to know. Uh, again, if you do do that, you're legally protected. So again, the, the legal questions that physicians often have to face. Do you have to tell employers, third parties about people's use? No, you don't at this point. So I think to sum up the legal piece for physicians, you know, I, I always want to point out that with the data and, again, the legal piece, most doctors don't want to do it. And, you know, I can recall a few weeks ago giving a talk where somebody pointed out, at least to this point, no physicians have been adversely affected, have not been found guilty in medical malpractice cases related to medical cannabis. That may change, but at this point, there, that hasn't occurred. But that said, there still is a lot of hesitancy, I would say, among physicians getting involved. What does a legitimate medical marijuana certification look like? Like I said earlier, a comprehensive evaluation. So not just talking about medical marijuana and this condition. What else is going on? Are there psychosocial stressors? Are there conditions for which marijuana might adversely affect? Again, depression, anxiety, et cetera, addiction, things like that. 
I do believe that the doctor treating the debilitating condition should be one, the one doing it. Ultimately, the core of this, the best way to do it, revolves around a really good risk-benefit discussion. So again, I'm not saying because this has significant side effects that you don't use it. I prescribe medicines with uh, significant potential side effects every day, almost. But you got to have that conversation. You, gotta, you can't take it lightly. And then again, full informed consent. Who is the appropriate candidate? You've got a debilitating condition with evidence to support that, right? And again, that is why the physician that knows the patient, they have a relationship over years, is a better person to make that determination than somebody who just met the patient. Again, as I said earlier, it's not a first-line treatment, but it can be a second-line treatment or a third-line treatment. But that's a conversation that you have. If you exhaust opportunities or other options, yeah, you can get to a place if you're treating pain where it might make sense. In certain indications, if we're talking about uh, nausea, let's say, if we're talking about appetite stimulation, you might need trials of the two cannabinoids that we talked about earlier. Ideally, you're not going to have another psychiatric condition, an access one condition, like depression, anxiety, ADHD. And of course, you have to be in a state that has this. So to, to start wrapping it up, I think, unfortunately, we're in this place where the policy is ahead of the science in many states. That's kind of a dangerous spot to be in. We're doing work, we're making progress, we're thinking about policy, how to do it better, how to underline this with better science, but states don't really seem to care about that. People want what they want, and they want it yesterday. So that's why we're in these predicaments where people are going to vote on it in states like Massachusetts. We're going to vote on legalization. I think you can do all of these policies. I think you can do medical marijuana well. I think you can do legalization well. But I think you got to start thinking about it now. And I think, unfortunately, voting it in and then trying to correct things later is a problem. Another problem that occurs is when advocates on either side write the laws. Okay? And we're having a similar situation in Massachusetts now. where We're going to vote on a legalization ballot initiative written by pro-marijuana advocates. I think it's pretty weak. I think there are key weaknesses there. And I do think we're going to say yes to it. And then the onus is on the legislature, which to this point has not wanted to get involved. It's up to them to correct everything, make it good. And that's a position I'd rather not be in, given the failures that we've had in Massachusetts and other states with other marijuana policy. <clears throat> Ultimately, from a clinical perspective, we need sound clinical judgment. That's what it boils down to. If medical marijuana is available, you need to be a good doctor. You need to be a good healthcare professional, take a good history, think about risk benefits, have that conversation, have it be a two-way process. I do think that this has the potential to help a lot of patients. And again, as more research is done, as we figure out what those 70 cannabinoids do, again, I think the landscape will, in fact, change. So it's a critical period. The trends are ominous. Monitoring the future is a key survey that I like to talk about when doing these kind of talks. And what it shows, among 12th graders, use of marijuana is different than the use of any other substance at this point. It's slightly increasing. So if we were to plot alcohol use, it's flatlining. As I like to say, alcohol is as dangerous as ever. Nicotine sharply declining. Nobody wants to use or, or smoke cigarettes these days. Everybody knows it's bad for you, right? But as the use of marijuana is gradually increasing among 12th graders, perception of risk is sharply declining. And a lot of people have different ideas about that, and some people disagree with me. Some people say it's solely because of these policies, and I don't think that's true. But I also think that we really don't do a very good job of educating people about marijuana, particularly kids, which is why this kind of night is so important. So the trends are ominous. It's hard not to imagine that things aren't going to get worse before they get better unless we really do a better job of talking about this in a productive way. Physicians, healthcare professionals are really at a position where they can affect a lot of people very positively by having conversations with patients. If somebody comes into me and I may not think that medical cannabis is good for them, but having that conversation might get them into treatment for some other condition that they wouldn't otherwise get into treatment for, right? So that's a great opportunity. How we respond as a society to medical marijuana can have a great impact upon how this is actually going to be implemented and how effective it can be. So I just want to thank a couple people who helped me with these talks. Alan Wartenberg is a local uh, addiction legend in the Northeast. Max Hurley is one of my uh, research assistants. Matt Palastro is also another one of my research assistants. He's not mentioned there. Roger Weiss is my division chief. 
And the Norfolk County DA provided that nice slide that you saw with one ounce of cannabis. So we're going to move to the Q&A now. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. I'll let you finish up since you just Okay, uh, yeah. so, so legalization of recreational use of marijuana. Again, uh, to me, this is a far more complex issue. I think you can make great arguments either way. Uh, the key arguments for legalization, I think, number one, that this is the United States, right? People should have the, the ability to decide to do, as adults, whatever they want, as long as it doesn't hurt other people. The second issue is really this issue of taxes, right? So Colorado has raised... $125 million in taxes in 2015. Some of that money is going to go to education that we talked about and treatment. So there's an opportunity to raise revenue for a policy that people seem to want. The third issue is an issue of incarceration. So we know from looking at, for example, the District of Columbia where uh, African Americans are eight times more likely to be incarcerated as a result of marijuana related charges when in fact we all use marijuana at about the same rate. Right? So there are issues there of inequality. I think the people who are against marijuana talk about this idea of whether or not uh, increased use will mean increased addiction. The data really hasn't supported that yet. Second one is, which is a legitimate point, certainly this idea that big tobacco or big alcohol will get involved with marijuana. And I think that's a legitimate fear given the checkered past that many of these companies have. And then finally, uh, the issue of driving, which to me is very scary, this idea that right now there is no marijuana breathalyzer. So in Colorado, if you're pulled over for driving under the influence of cannabis, they drive out to you, they draw your blood, and I think that's the best that you can do, but it's really not a good proxy for impairment under the influence of cannabis. Today's Monday. If I used a lot of marijuana late Friday or Saturday, I may still exceed the limit of five nanograms per ml milliliter in Colorado. And again, I may not be impaired. So I think there are issues where it needs to be more research for us to feel more comfortable about people using more marijuana and driving, perhaps. So I think those are the core issues with legalization. I agree with, uh, I used to definitely be against legalization. And over the past number of years, I've definitely evolved in thinking about it. And the, a lot of the reasons that I'm against it are some of the reasons that Dr. Hill mentioned, but also because a lot of the work that we do focuses on the developing brain. And I don't care what everyone says, just because we're saying we're legalizing it for adults, we also know that kids smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol. So you know, there's no perfect anything in saying we can prevent um, the developing, you know, kids um, getting exposed to marijuana. So I think that that was one of the reasons for me in not legalizing it. And also for some of the data that you, know, you had mentioned, that we know that perception of marijuana in terms of it, there's not being bad in fact in, that people think that it's so good. And a lot of the young kids, again, thinking that um, there's nothing, there's no bad health effects of marijuana. So we're giving a very false um, information and trying to decide on legalization. However, because there's this tide, and even though the tide might be not informed by evidence, there's a big tide in our society that's pushing towards um, legalization. We can use some of that money that if indeed certain taxes are, are obtained to help people who are today have a problem and perhaps more might have problems. So I think in terms of if we can legalize in a very um, structured manner, in a manner that really helps people, then I think legalization um, can be done with some of the, the, the caveats that you mentioned, that if we are really do it correctly, rather than just saying everything is open, everything, because I think that that's, at the end of the day, it is a drug, plain and simple, no matter what people say. 
So I think that we do have certain obligations to our society and government's role is to protect the, the people. And so in one sense, we're talking about protection um, and just because we are a democratic society doesn't mean that everything is fair game. There still should be certain aspects of protection from wearing seat belts and so on. But I think it's about knowledge and evidence and then being able to use that to not criminalize people. I think that the criminalization has been um, very bad and I think all the negatives are some of the reasons why everyone is pushing now, like I said before, you know, we started off with you know, the reefer madness that everybody's going to go crazy and then now to this, you know, opposite side of this utopia. So there must be some place in the middle where science, um, recreational people, rec recreational use in a, in a positive manner can be, that can coincide. And that's why I think that, you know, eventually I think legalization, there can be certain middle ground. I like that idea. I think that's where we're going. We talked about the positive randomized controlled trials for chronic pain, and I think that anybody that reads those trials or treats patients like Dr. Waller does knows that it's really hard to measure the uh, indices for effective treatment for chronic pain. But I think functional outcomes is a good place to go. I do think importantly, though, to do those kind of trials, that gets back to the issue of how many regulatory hoops there are to jump through. And again, I think it makes the point that we need to reschedule cannabis. Just to uh, put a fine point on that, when you talk about a Schedule One substance, it really means two things. Number one, that it's addictive, and this is, but the, the second piece is that it has absolutely no medical value, and I don't think that's a case that can be cogently made at this point. You also need to think about the two cannabinoids that we talked about earlier that are FDA approved are uh, uh, dronabinol is Schedule Three, and Navalone is Schedule Two. I mean, e even cocaine schedule too. So, so I think that rescheduling uh, marijuana, which is favored by some of the presidential candidates, would be a big step. And uh, the next one would be the overlap, talking about the uh, movement of this genetic information from generation to generation. And I'm wondering, uh, a couple of the questions were, could you expand on how you believe, you know, that, that and I think the question is, is this an epigenetic phenomenon versus a direct genetic uh, as you want. <laughs> <laughs> I know I was very sciencey, and I actually didn't <laughs> talk so much about the epigenetics. So our research shows that there's a, it's an epigenetic phenomenon. So genetics, you inherit your DNA sequence from your parents, and epigenetics are the things that happen to you during your lifetime that will change whether or not your DNA is open or closed. And when it's open or closed over certain genes, that gene will be either turned on when it's open or turned off when it's closed in a simplified manner. And so what happens to us, as I said during our lifetime, we thought that, you know, um, sperm and an egg, when you pass on things, your things in your lifetime gets erased. And you only pass on your DNA sequence. But we know now that that's not true. Not only for marijuana, I think that this is, um, you see this even in the famine in Europe. You saw things on their grandkids for the people who went through this famine. So we knew that environment could pass to generations. Because it's epigenetic, I'm actually hopeful. And I'm hopeful in the sense of it's giving us some insights into even how we can develop novel treatments for um, anxiety, addiction, some of the behaviors that we see in, in, in the animals that, that um, across the generations. Because you can change the genetic sequence that you inherit from your parents, but you can change the epigenetic status of your genes. And a lot of medications are being developed now Yes, a lot of them in cancer, um, but we're seeing that we're trying to use some of them in psychiatry-related um, research, and we're definitely hopeful that some of these will be beneficial. So one of the things we saw from our animals, like I said, it's epigenetic, and the changes that we saw were in methylation of the DNA. And what that means is a lot of women 
especially for, from a certain socioeconomic group, you take um, prenatal vitamins that have folate. And that actually normalizes certain methylation. It's important for methylation status. So perhaps humans are already um, normalizing certain negative epigenetic um, conditions that might have been transmitted to their kids. So perhaps, as I said, because it's epigenetic, we know we can reverse it. We just have trying to figure out how. So the genetics would be much tougher. We know that there are genetic vulnerability to certain, like I said before, why certain people when they use marijuana, they may show greater anxiety, absolutely traits, and become dependent much quicker. And that definitely we see relates a lot to genetics. But epigenetics also plays a role. Thank you. So Dr. Hill, um, this is an interesting one. Uh, <laughs> I've not heard of uh, many instances of physicians having the ability to revoke or overwrite the recommendations of a, quote, marijuana doc, even in the face of an addiction. Is there a reluctance to counter another doctor's opinion, or is this something that could be addressed in uh, policy? Uh, well, I, I think the second part is a little easier to answer. There always is a reluctance to counter another doc's uh, opinion. I think that there's some deference played. Or there's questions about, you know, is this person more knowledgeable in a certain area than I? Do they know the patient better than I? Um, but I would say this, that uh, the first piece is uh, an issue that really is prominent in many states right now, this idea that, again, like I mentioned, many physicians don't believe in it, and yet many patients show up on their panel, you know, in their office, already on medical cannabis. So what do you do? The best way to go about it, again, is to have a conversation with your patient about it. Does this make sense for you? What are treatments that you think might make better sense? And I do think there are times when if you have those kind of conversations and you really feel strongly that medical cannabis is not a good idea in that patient, I think it's okay to have a conversation where possible about the fit. You know, this is something that I talk about with my residents all the time, that, you know, this may not be a good fit. You might be better uh, served getting your care elsewhere if I really feel strongly that medical cannabis will be something that's harmful to you. Uh, so, so, again, I think ultimately those are very, very real challenges, but I would like to believe that they can be addressed in the office between the doctor and the patient rather than... Um, going outside and, and talking with other docs about it, which I think is important. I mean, it, it, ideally, and again, that's another uh, issue with these kind of clinics, is that it's standard practice for me to be in touch with other doctors who are treating my patients. And yet, what I've found is that people who are in, uh, as patients in these clinics, you know, those doctors really don't do a great job of talking with other docs uh, about uh, the, the overall treatment plan. Well, I think one of the problems we have here is the last two docs I've tried to find with my patients uh, were in some random white van in a parking lot at a gas <laughs> station so, uh, for like one hour in a day that they've you know, put in a paper. So sometimes coordination of care is definitely uh, difficult in this, in this world. Um, so I think this is a bigger one that we'll answer, kind of finish with. But let's, the, the one that came up a number of times was the discussion about the, uh, the CBD versus THC argument and um, with the raising of the THC, a couple of components showed up in some questions. So one is, um, does the increase in the THC um, affect the, uh, the outcome of what CBD does to the brain, mean, and, or vice versa, meaning if you have higher CBD, does it make THC safer? Um, and then the other one was, how extensive is the breeding requirement in order to get that? Because a lot of the arguments are that this is a very natural substance and um, I, I'm sensing it's not based on the, uh, the breeding habits that we're finding right. at this point, so. So, I mean, um, it's always uh, um, funny to me when people say, but marijuana is organic, it's natural. Um, but everything on those streets today, they are grown and they were very much specific to increasing THC to increase that high. Um, now the dispensaries give you the range of you know, do you want to get this kind of high versus this kind of sleep or, versus, you know, I'm hearing like all of these nuances. So, and what that means, the nuances, is that the ratio of THC to cannabidiol differs. So, as I said, the, the plants that have the bigger high will have bigger THC. 
people have done, there are a number of studies going on in terms of looking at the impact of uh, THC and cannabidiol in the plant with the psychoactive or the behavior that people show. Um, when you look at schizophrenia, for example, or psychosis, I should say, so psychosis is clearly much more co correlated with the concentration of THC. So they do like hair samples, and you look at uh, someone, the concentration of THC or CBD in the hair, and you correlate it to um, psychosis. And what the hair gives you is like history of the person's use. And you see the plants that people have been smoking that have higher THC concentration, they show have higher incidences of psychosis compared to those that have the strains of the plant that have more cannabidiol, CBD, much lower um, psychosis associated with that. So things like that, those types of studies have started to help people understand um, you know, the impact of THC or cannabidiol. When you treat, so the studies that I showed you or this one study um, with cannabidiol helping to decrease craving in, in heroin dependent subjects and decreasing their anxiety, a similar work has not found that cannabidiol actually has been effective for marijuana, marijuana dependence or cannabis dependence. Again, we're in the early stages of these uh, research, so we'll see as more studies are done. Um, in animals, the cannabidiol was shown to be quite effective for alcoholism, weeks, again, um, replicating our study, weeks after the final um, administration. So the question will be, is cannabidiol gonna be more effective for certain um, drugs versus others? There are studies going on now with cannabidiol with cocaine. We'll see. Um, the dosing of cannabidiol is also critical that we see depending on the drug class. So again, you need a lot of research, but um, THC, especially in certain vulnerable populations, the concentration, as I said, more with psychosis, the greater high, cannabidiol decreases anxiety. Um, in Europe, they've shown in a number of studies that it actually worked as an antipsychotic in schizophrenic subjects. Um, again, you know, those are, we'll see as more and more studies come up as the numbers improve, increases, we'll see, be able to get some insights. Great, thank you. Can I just add one thing? Absolutely. I think w one thing that for those of you that know not quite as much about the, these things, I think the reason why THC and CBD are always mentioned in, in, in uh, tandem is that they actually compete, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but they complete, compete for certain precursors at a plant level. So that's why you can adjust if you're gonna increase the THC level the CBD level will go down, and I think that you know that's the the connection there. We we only happen to talk about these two, but I think part of it is because they're so interconnected um, from a uh, plant level. Yeah, and those were the two highest cannabinoids in the plants. I showed you a picture with a number of other cannabinoids. They're at lower concentrations, but we know that some of those other cannabinoids also have some beneficial effects, actually. Again, a lot of research going on, but because they're so low in concentration, and as they've, uh, as they've developed these new strains, they've inadvertently decreased the amount of those cannabinoids in the plant, everybody focuses on THC. Um, so that's the reason. Uh, Dr. Hill, I'm wondering if you could address, we have a number of questions about the uh, medical side effects of smoking marijuana, given the number of toxins that are um, in it that are mm -hmm. consistent with uh, tobacco. Um, mm -hmm inhalation and, uh, and what we know about COPD, cancer risks, and uh, just overall lung effects. Okay, so, so we're taking a step beyond the typical side effects. So again, there, there are side effects that you can have. You use marijuana today, you can be impaired driving, you can make different decisions that you might normally make. And as I alluded to in the talk, most of the problems are associated with chronic use. Specifically talking about the physical problems with use, not a lot of data. I think there's many studies that have looked at the respiratory issues, and again, I'm not a pulmonologist, um, but the, the data there suggests you, you are more likely to have uh, inflammation occur, let's say, so bron bronchitis, that sort of thing. But overall, there, there doesn't seem to be a connection between cannabis use and, and overall lung function, nor, nor cancer to this point. I think that the data uh, really is showing for the most part that long-term cannabis use really doesn't affect health in the way that we think. And I think there are more papers that are on the way there. Certainly not going to, you know, as a physician, you're not going to recommend that somebody smoke a medication, um, but there isn't an overwhelming amount of evidence 
um, that points to these things that people worry about, like cancer, for example. Dr. Hurd, a pretty straightforward question. Uh, what is the effect of using marijuana on the uh, unborn baby? Bad, no. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, there are a number of studies showing that the, um, smoking decreases um, the fetal size of the, of the offspring. Um, some of that, you know, coming back to one of the things that I, I think I, I should have emphasized, um, a number of the people who do smoke marijuana also smoke cigarettes. And so when we see in the moms that, you know, trying to dissociate some of the effects of marijuana from their cigarette use while they were pregnant. However, when you control for all the other drugs that they may uh, consume, um, you definitely see that THC, even in our we did the human studies, it decreases the, um, the fetal size. And from our animal models, like I said, we can, sh we can follow that animal into adulthood very easily, much quicker than in our humans. And we see that it has behavioral effects as well. So um, there have been two longitudinal studies that are really well done, one in Canada, uh, middle class white communities, um, and one in, um, in Philadelphia where inner, inner city um, minority populations, and they've, watched, they've studied these kids over time to see what are the effects of um, prenatal marijuana exposure. And both show you know, similar things. You see things, um, they're not stupid. It's not that the children have their lower IQ, it's not. But there are certain cognitive um, functional differences that um, are, are noted. There are certain issues with um, uh, some social behaviors. There are um, some issues of depression and you increase drug addiction vulnerability. But it's tough in the, in the human studies to really separate out the prenatal effects from also being raised in a family um, where you know, smoking marijuana and taking drugs during pregnancy was not the norm. So again, the human studies are tough to tease out the, the complex interactions of other drugs and being raised in the same um, home. But our animal models, if you, they definitely show these long-term effects um, on, on brain and behavior. Great, uh, one quick one and then a follow-up after that uh, for uh, Dr. Hill. Um, do all patients with medical marijuana get the same supply every time they pick up their prescription, <laughs> i.e., everybody gets oh. 10 ounces every 60 days, um, or does it change based on their condition, age, psychiatric condition, or uh, treatment path? Uh, the latter. So mm -hmm. not everyone gets 10 ounces every time. A lot of it depends on how, how much you, you want to buy at, at a given time. You know, the price, price matters here. Uh, um, so again, it does depend a lot. I think one of the points that we try to make when talking about best practices for medical cannabis is that uh, the physician, again, who's certifying should move more into that conversation about how to do this, how much to use, what to use. Probably better to have the physician have that conversation than have someone go in and talk to the bud tender who decides uh, what they're going to get. And, and how they're going to do it. So I think that's one of the major issues that we face. And then the follow-up to, uh, uh, to that one is, uh, would you prescribe marijuana to a minor? Would I? Uh, <laughs> so, so again, if you had said license and uh, we're in said van. Oh. So number one, you're never going to prescribe marijuana, right? So that, let's Today. get that. So, well, I mean, yes, you have a, it, it's yeah. never going to be FDA approved, the, the plant itself. So this is an illegal substance according to the federal government. So you certify somebody for use. Um, but yeah, people uh, do write certifications for minors. And it really depends upon uh, the medical condition. I think it's important. You know, we really didn't talk about it today yet. But again, thinking about cannabis and CBD in particular, um, there you know, it's studies that uh, were being publicized today where um, very positive uh, phase two trials and, and moving into phase three, looking at cannabidiol for kids that have uh, Dravet syndrome, which is a form of uh, seizure disorder where they have multiple seizures. So uh, I was talking with somebody about this last week. If you're a parent and your child is having multiple seizures a day and they're not functioning well and you're working with your neurologist and you've tried everything else, I mean, there definitely can be a place where it makes sense, given the fact that we only have these two 
uh, cannabinoids, and neither of them have CBD. So, so I think there can be a place there, but it is obviously a, uh, a tricky situation. Okay, Dr. Hurd, there are a couple of questions talking about the uh, placebo um, problem that you have when you're trying to do studies on marijuana. And the, the crux of the question is, what do you use? And uh, are there things that we could be using so that we could better mimic the uh, uh, happy yeah. changes as compared to the medicinal changes? That is the problem. I don't think that there's any study that has done a perfect uh, placebo with THC. It's very tough. So what people do so are some of the things I mentioned before. They'll measure naturalistic marijuana use in relation to certain symptoms um, or, you know, the the clinical FDA drugs that are there, but in terms of the marijuana plant itself, there, it's really impossible in a person who knows how cannabis feels to give them a, a to even smoke or vape something that's not cannabis. With that said, I mean, for cannabidiol, it's different because cannabidiol actually is not rewarding. So um, the placebo for cannabidiol is easy, and that can be quite, um, so the placebo studies are much more um, appropriate. But for t looking at the THC, so what you do instead, people look at concentrations of THC or to just see whether or not um, they're, not placebo, but the dose-dependent effects on certain symptoms. And that is easier to control than saying versus placebo or no drug, you can look at different doses. And I think that that's one of the things. But you know, I, I do want to say a point, and even with the, the, the cannabidiol for Dravet's, a lot of the parents, and even Sanjay Gupta and everybody, promoting medical marijuana. It's not medical marijuana, it's medical cannabidiol. It's really important to, to like I said, if the one thing you guys get from today, marijuana is a, a plant with many cannabinoids. When we're treating, and you're saying that to a child, that you're going to prescribe as you should to a child, if you're a neurologist, you're following them, they have Dravet syndrome, they're getting cannabidiol. They're not getting marijuana, they're getting cannabidiol. So I think that that's one thing as a society and the policymakers really need to separate the different components perhaps as well, um, but everybody puts it under this umbrella of medical marijuana. You're not going to give your child a marijuana you plan and say, smoke this. These families, they've gone through a lot. They will even themselves um, take the cannabidiol um, dominant, the plant that predominantly has cannabidiol, and even try it to make sure they extract the cannabidiol for their kids when they weren't in places that it was legal to give their kids cannabidiol. So that's one thing I do think that legalization helps parents, or even though I think you can still have medical usage of a drug like morphine and we don't legalize heroin. But I think that those are the things I think that's really important to understand. Great, I'm gonna consolidate about four questions into one. Hopefully it's <laughs> not really confusing. Um, so, and this is for you, Dr. Hill. When they were talking about, we've sometimes tell patients after heart surgery that they need uh, to drink alcohol uh, daily because it's been shown to decrease uh, coronary artery disease. Um, to about the same level of studies as some of the things that we've seen within marijuana. Not that that decreases it, but it only has a couple of studies that show benefit. And comparing marijuana to other drugs for use in recreation, and then looking at the, uh, the fact that we have known bad side effects with dicey research to show positive effect. So we, so we have information that shows that you have an increased risk of addiction. We have information that shows that you have an increased risk of a psychotic break if a kid gets it in their adolescent phase. And all of the states that are on the top of the list of adolescent marijuana use are in those states that have medical marijuana available. So if you look at the numbers of adolescents that are utilizing um, marijuana in the states that have uh, legalized marijuana, it's almost double the number of adolescents who use as a percentage basis. And if you start using at 10th grade, you're six times more likely to drop out. So Understanding that known harm from marijuana, I'm not talking about like a direct, I'm gonna smoke weed and have like a PCP, you know, angel dust meltdown, I'm gonna, that. I'm talking about all of those known factors with the possibility of some medical benefit for a small group of people, with the possibility of 
some recreational benefit as compared to someone who would rather use a lot of alcohol rather than that. So did I nail that at all? <laughs> or are we Good all luck. more confused question? than where we started? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, which yeah, is I mean, worse. <laughs> but basically, we have known we have known uh, issues uh, societally yep. for marijuana and the drug itself, and we also have known issues for alcohol, obviously, and, sure. and those things. But uh, what's the case for actually just adding another one to the mix? If we don't have great medical data, and we know that these other ones we spend most of our life trying to fix. So a couple couple Back. things that a couple ways I like to think about this. The first one is. Uh, comparing marijuana to these other drugs, alcohol, for example. I like the comparison between marijuana and alcohol. I think it's a good one. The reality is most people who use both of these substances don't develop addiction. Right? As much as we're talking about the negative effects today, most people who use both don't develop addiction. The main difference between the two as a society is that we recognize that alcohol is dangerous. Right? We always talk about ways to limit risks with alcohol. Designated driver is a great example. We don't do that with cannabis, and we should. right? We've got 22 million Americans using marijuana in the last year, so we need to talk about the risks. However, I do think it's important to point out, when you think about, I like to think about a continuum here, marijuana, alcohol, opioids. Okay, So marijuana, again, I, I, there are many problems with it, but on the whole, probably not as bad as alcohol. And so the president uh, said that, could have said it probably a little bit better than he did, but, but in, in, in all essence, I mean, he, he's right. It's not as bad as alcohol is. Similarly, alcohol, probably not as bad as opioids, right? People are dying every day from opioid overdoses. I think the piece that we don't focus on is this idea that, you know, marijuana may not be as bad as these other two substances, but it doesn't mean that it's not dangerous, right? It's still dangerous but probably not as bad as these other two substances. I think the, the first piece uh, that you talked about, it, talking about legalizing another substance, really gets into one of the great controversies here. And again, I think this is where, uh, number one, a lot of the evidence isn't what we thought, and then number two, you need to be open, I think, to the evidence. And so when we think about the, the when we plot marijuana use in the country, in states that have these policies and states that don't, everyone's use is going up. Okay, so before the policies, everyone's use is going up. Uh, let's take Colorado, for example. So Colorado use going up like this, medical marijuana comes in, use continues to go up. It doesn't, the rate of change is not there. It just continues to increase the same rate. And then when they legalized marijuana, there was no difference there either. So, so by and large, the data so far does not show that these policies increase the use, the rate of use. So everyone's having more use, but the policies themselves, I don't think are the reason for that. And, and where the data is better is for medical marijuana. So there was a great paper that came out, I encourage you to read it, came out in one of the top journals, Lancet Psychiatry in 2015. The, the first author uh, is uh, Deborah Hassan from Columbia. And they showed very nicely that in the medical marijuana states, there was no increased use relative to the non-medical marijuana state. So again, everyone's use is increasing, but the policy is not the cause for that, according to that paper. And similarly, in Colorado so far, uh, the same kind of uh, trend is showing for legalization. So I know that's not the answer that a lot of people want, uh, but, but I think that when you think about it, you have a ubiquitous substance, and the policies really haven't changed uh, the availability to, to this degree. Doesn't mean that you know, we might not see other studies down the road, but to this point, you know, it just hasn't been the case. But a lot of those states started off much higher. So the states that went into medical marijuana and legalizing marijuana were already states that had much higher use for teens even than the other states. So we'll see in a couple years, as, because I think a lot of the other states are newer as time goes on, but yeah, but definitely the rates have been the same. Uh, but they started up higher. Yeah, but, but why is that? I mean, I think Massachusetts is a great example, right? So again, we're, we're a pretty liberal state. So, you know, people in Massachusetts, Vermont, places like that, they're going to be open to using marijuana, and they always have been. And so the policies really haven't changed the use in those states or others. And so, so again, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to change my mind if I see the evidence, but I've looked at the papers so far, and I've looked at the data, and, and I don't think the policies are, are the reason that, uh, you know, that the, the trend has stayed the same. You know, I think that we can do these things and do them well. I think there are many factors at play here, and we need to look at them all.
Great, we have more questions in time. So I'm gonna ask a couple of really quick ones, get a quick answer, then we can go to live questions. Um, and so we'll start off with, um, what is the best way for providers to stay up to date um, on the latest evidence? Great question. Uh, so again, I, you know, I've been all over talking about uh, medical marijuana, and I know that um, providers are clamoring for this information. And so journals know that too. There have been a lot of great papers that have come out, uh, and I think more are on the way. I would just encourage you to talk to your local um, medical society and say, you know, I feel like we're not getting what we need to get. And, um, you know, people are, people are having those kind of CME events, but again, we need to do, and this is a great opportunity here, you know, there's going to be a publication that comes out. So we uh, collectively need to do a better job of educating, and I think this type of event does that. And the NIH, their website, they're trying to be uh, much more um, keeping up to date. And so NIMH, NIDA, all of those are, are, I think those websites are really trying to have things there uh, for providers as well. Yeah, the NIDA website's done a good job. It's yeah. drugabuse.gov. Exactly. Drug uh, they, they keep up to date on all the marijuana stuff yeah. pretty well, actually. Yeah. Um, the next one is for you, Dr. Hurd. Animal models are important indicators of positive interventions through preclinical research. Are there any data from animal studies that have been shown untrue in human clinical studies? In other words, are uh, developmental or genetic differences obvious so that we could move past the animal study into human studies? Um, so, you know, I never believe in obvious because that's why we're researchers. A lot of things that we think are obvious are not there until we actually do it and look at data. So I think that the preclinical work, they provide a foundation and I think one of the things that we don't do very well in research is move quicker to the human. So we sometimes, you know, by the time you get through um, studying whether or not this is true or not, um, it might not really be relevant to some of the human things. So I think that, um, yeah, I think that the animal work um, is important, but I think trying to get to understand what's happening in the human um, is even more important. Um, and being able to actually go back and forth. So we go back and forth where we see things, and you can really look at also even genetic things in animal models and see whether or not um, it affects treatment and response and so on. Great. Are there any conditions where marijuana is the only treatment? <laughs> We hope not, or as a society, we are doomed. <laughs> no, and I don't just mean for marijuana. What we want for the clinical toolbox, you want many options for clinicians to treat their patients. We hope that not every person that comes into your, your practice is gonna look the same. Even if they might have an umbrella definition of a disorder, we know that th those disorders are very heterogeneous. The, clini the clinical toolkit really needs many different types of options for their clinicians. So if marijuana is the only, we're in trouble as researchers and as um, physicians and so on. I, I agree. Um, no conditions that solely respond to cannabis. This is a one we can give. This could, this could be a, a symposium all by itself for, for you and I, but this is a pretty easy, quick, quick answer. Um, if we consolidate it, I think. But the, uh, how closely uh, uh, do spice and bath salts uh, and designer drugs resemble cannabinoids? Now, bath salts are different, so we'll just set those aside yeah. as a, a stimulant yeah, from a cotton plant. But so, so that's a great question. question. So um, other forms of marijuana that are commonly talked about. So synthetic marijuana, um, the concentrates, wax shatter, people talk about dabbing, e-cigarettes. Again, you can put anything into an e-cigarette device. Uh, and then the edibles, so those are all things we could talk about. But in terms of the synthetics, really been hot lately. Certain um, athletes have gotten involved with synthetics, and, and they're really dangerous for a variety of reasons. I think, number one, you don't know what you're getting. So these are um, cannabinoid agonists like THC. Uh, they're not THC, but they're similar to THC. And in those packets, two things. Number one, there's no CBD buffer. So you're just getting this strong agonist effect. So the bad things that happen with marijuana, paranoia, things like that, more likely to occur with synthetics. The other thing is when they spray uh, cannabinoids onto the potpourri, if anybody's ever tried to spray paint anything, it's really hard to get a uniform coat. So as a result, there's quite a variation in concentrations within a packet. So um, for the most part, I think these 
substances are more dangerous than marijuana. And then the other piece, just to mention, when thinking about who might use these, these are people who are getting drug tested, right? So people who are on probation, people who might live in group homes, athletes, um, military, things like that. So um, kind of an ethical issue of, of itself, as Dr. Waller mentioned, is, is our drug testing in certain realms pushing people to use more dangerous substances? I think it's a scary thought. So connecting a couple of questions, uh, utilizing the weight of a substance to regulate it, especially when you can rapidly increase the concentration of said substance at that weight, um, it, that doesn't make sense. I think we would all agree that that's one of the big loopholes. But then moving into that, um, it begs the question of the data, uh, those data that we look at from the vast majority of our references are done on 3, 6, 9, and 12 percent THC at the most, and almost nothing is out there at all yeah. for greater than 20 percent THC. And so how can we then take, quote, medical marijuana, which is based on THC concentration, and then state that more is better, as com or equivalent even, um, and give an informed consent for the utilization of medical marijuana when we haven't studied it at all um, in any way, shape, or form? I think you've answered it at the same time you asked the question. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. Um, I think the one thing that people forget, so when we're studying um, medical marijuana and you want to look at the range of doses, because like I said, we still don't know what dose range for which particular symptoms, it is going to be very difficult clinically to give someone very high amounts of THC, you know, that's out there in recreational plants and so on. So, you know, just the dosing effects are, are, are critical things to consider. Um, I know you had, you probably wanted to, I'll let you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so again, I want to emphasize though what Dr. Hurd said. So when we talk about the adverse effects of marijuana and the, the possible benefits, dose matters, right? So people often try to lump everything together, studies that show, you know, adverse effects, but a lot of it depends upon what people are using, how often they're using, you know, how much over what period of time. So the dose is critical. Somebody using once a week, you know, and mm -hmm. It's not the same as somebody using regularly, which is nearly every day. So, so that's a major point whenever we talk about cannabis. The other piece is a policy issue, I think as uh, Dr. Waller was alluding to, was that, and, and many experts from RAND and other places have talked about this too, we often tax marijuana in sort of a flat way. You know, this product is going to be taxed at this you know, percentage. And you know, I think you can do that effectively, and so the tax rates need to be high, and so in the states that have legalized recreational marijuana, average effective tax rates, so all the tax rates lumped together, 27 to 44 percent. Um, but if you really wanted to do this scientifically, you could probably tax it even better if you based it upon THC content. So it's worth pointing out. I mean, I think that um, you can figure out tax rates for the entire plant and do better than some states are proposing, but if we really wanted to get technical, then it probably would be better to tax it per uh, THC content. Great, so I'm going to finish with this for the written questions, and then we'll go to uh, live uh, questions. If you could have everything go uh, the way you would like, i.e. clinical trials, marijuana uh, dispensation, FDA involvement, et cetera, what would that look like for medical marijuana? <laughs> um, for me, I think that, as I said, what, how I would love to see medical marijuana, taking into consideration all the things that you said, um, I do hate the term medical marijuana because we would definitely need to be very specific as to which components of the plant, and perhaps there could be different names as we understand dosage, as we understand strains for specific symptoms. So I would love a characterization which will help clinicians, help researchers of, you know, the different types of medical quote unquote marijuana. So that would be an ideal thing to me that once we have enough knowledge to know, as I said, the dose, the strains that are um, really alleviating this symptom for this class of, 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 um, of uh, disorders versus this. I would still want for medical marijuana um, to have much more um, physician oversight, I think all the things that Dr. Hill um, raised in his presentation are key to having 
you would never do this for any other, you know, for disorders, you wouldn't go to the person who said in the van or ask for, you know, just on the website, just send me a bunch of, of marijuana for your disorder. We don't do that with any other drug. Actually, no other drug are we having politicians and the, and our, and the average person say that something is medicinal. No one had voted on Prozac. No one voted on all these other medications. So it's very strange that for the first time, one of the first times we're having, you know, like I said, politicians and normal public determine whether or not something is medicinal. So that to me, we need to really as a society think about why do we go through all the hoops of making sure something is safe for the consumer. So I would really love when medical marijuana becomes the lay of the land, that there are regulations, that there's knowledge about the plants, the strains for specific disorders, and everybody who buys a, no matter where you go, you know that this has this percentage of THC. It doesn't, we didn't talk about other things, about pesticides and so on, and all the other things, but we know that it's pure, we know that this, and you taking that particular drug in California is the same thing that someone in, in, you know, in Vermont is taking for that particular symptom. So my utopia for medical marijuana would be that. Thanks. Uh, so a couple, I mean, low-hanging fruit, I think definitely rescheduling cannabis would be a great first step. So that way yeah. you could start to do these trials, try to tailor the certain cannabinoids for certain conditions. However, while that is going on, I do think that we should be looking at medical marijuana as it's currently constituted. And while there are trials that should be done with the, the whole plant, another thing that is key that we haven't talked about today are these ideas of uh, medical cannabis registries. So in uh, Michigan, we got 25, 30,000 patients, something like that, and we should be following these people. So what, what are their functional outcomes looking like? And so those are things that you can do relatively easily. And so that, I think that would be a great start because this is here, and so we need to think about how to do this more safely in, in a smarter way. Great, so we have about uh, 10 minutes for questions, so uh, fire away, euphemistically speaking. <laughs> Um, my question has to do, you know, in the context of you can't quite manage, you can't quite manage what you're not measuring. Are there, are there any future for uh, ICD-10 codes for marijuana or, or medical marijuana type diagnosis? And if so, uh, can it, you know, how, how, how can it be used in population data to, whether it's through claims or some other, other mechanism to help in, um, getting the data that we need to really direct, you know, whether it's quality <coughs> metrics or whatever we want to utilize. So, so I don't know if there would be a diagnosis itself for, I mean, uh, there are conditions that we use it for, and, and those uh, diagnoses w wouldn't change, but a registry really wouldn't be that complicated to uh, enact. Again, you know, there are ways to hook it up. So we already have uh, prescription monitoring programs, and so the state of Connecticut, for example, already has the PDMP in Connecticut linked to their medical cannabis program, so that's a way to do it. Another way to do it, again, we have electronic medical records in many, many health systems now. Those health systems have many patients who have uh, medical cannabis already on board, so it'd be great to know who those patients are and to start to follow them. So, so I don't know if uh, the diagnoses necessarily would change, but there definitely are ways to find out what's really going on, what are the impacts of, of, of of medical cannabis, and then hopefully learning from that and making changes where necessary. Excellent di dialogue. Thank you for all the information you brought us. Your last response to the part about the panacea and whether it could be um, um, controlled brings to mind the homeopathic um, group of uh, doctors, uh, Eastern medicine, all of these that are also not FDA and I'm sorry if I'm speaking out of turn, but less FDA approval or certification. Would there be ways in which we could, because part of this culture comes from some of that same culture of homeopathy, self-care, is there a way we could control or advocate for or make more safe those at the same time? Is there a, is there a federal law or some way that, yeah. something that's already underway? I mean like the nutraceuticals and homeopathic, exactly. um, yeah. I mean, I, I do think that, um, okay, I'm gonna, st I'm gonna step back. 
I'm going to step back in the sense of we've known on this planet many different tribes around the world that there are certain things that have worked um, for treating symptoms from the beginning of time. And people have looked and noted that the bark of a tree treated as, you know, headaches and it's now aspirin. We no longer go for that bark of the tree, we take an aspirin instead. We can learn a lot from all of this. I don't think that, I'm not saying that um, homeopathic um, nutraceuticals are not beneficial at all. I just think that for those that can induce certain symptoms, such as psychosis, such as, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're not causing more harm when we, we are trying to do all this good, that we're causing more harm. So yes, I think that there are federal things that can be done in, if someone says this particular thing cures this, they need to prove it. That's all we're saying. If they're saying that you know, it treats this, then just prove it. It doesn't matter if it's from a pharmaceutical company or from a nutraceutical um, organization. I think it's in our society, we just you know, we say prove. Here we go. I have a question about um, medical marijuana. It's been legal here in Michigan for almost eight years and in other states, but yet, as you mentioned, we don't have any dispensaries for them. So do patients, when they go to get their, their medical marijuana from whomever, do they pay a street price? And is there any talk about insurance coverage for medical marijuana? So great question. So <laughs> the first one was, do they pay a street price? There's no other choice, mm -hmm. I think, at, at this point. You know, if you're, if you're I, like I said, dispensaries are, I guess, on the way in Michigan. But that's a, a problem in many states. Many states have had medical marijuana laws on the books for many years. And again, voters want it, but yet the implementation has been poor. Uh, the second piece, insurance companies, well, that's, uh, you know, as I like to say, it's hard enough to get insurance companies to pay for things that we know have a lot of evidence. And so this is a place where we have less evidence. So. Uh, medical cannabis uh, certainly not going to be covered anytime soon by any insurance companies, unfortunately. I would say in, in Michigan, you know, they're trying to to write the policies that will actually track it from seed to pres you know prescribe you know dispensing all the way through, so that they can track it genetically as well. Um, and that's hard. I mean, that's a huge system which requires allocation of funds, uh, which we all know uh, is not exactly an open treasure chest at our state level. So. What they have said to me, because I've talked about that you know, at, the, at the state level here at Michigan, is that they know that we have to have a system there, but they want to actually make sure and weigh the benefits and the risks uh, when they do that. So they're trying to take a very mindful approach to that uh, so that when they do do it, uh, to live up to what the, the voters had asked for, that they're going to do it in such a way that it doesn't seem to significantly increase risk to the adolescents and um, doesn't put us in a position like Denver where there are more dispensaries than pharmacies. Um, you know, things like that. So uh, I think those are the things that they're uh, trying to look for. And how do you zone and can you have so many, it's like a liquor license pathway, can you have so many in a, in a, a zone and is it a city or is it a boundary or is it a parish, you know, those, those types of things. And could I just, I mean, it's actually coming by I mean, some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, you know, one of the things about medical marijuana and why I started going a little bit more towards legalization is even the street drugs. If we can get rid of the street uh, marijuana, at least you know what you're buying. Coming back also to even the synthetics, even people think that they're getting regular marijuana and sometimes there are things sprayed on them. So I do think that having more um, state, uh, federal regulation of quote unquote medical marijuana, part of my utopia would be that we would decrease you know, the regular street marijuana so that we could have um, better control over what people are ingesting. But that's utopia because it will cost more than growing it in your backyard. Anything else? Yes, sir. You have a microphone. Right here. <coughs> So the question is about uh, how other countries are handling it, such as the Dutch model or uh, China or India. Yeah, well, right now, many countries are actually in the same place that we are, think, thinking about legalizing recreational marijuana, looking at medical marijuana. Um, some places are further along than we are, and some places are, are less further developed than, than we are. Um, in terms of thinking about other models and 
what the outcomes have been. I mean, I think, for example, the, the Dutch model has been somewhat mixed. I think that uh, you get a lot of people going to those places to use cannabis. You have people who, you know, I have friends uh, from, um, from there that say that, you know, it still is a problem there. You know, people talk about it as being so much better than here, but marijuana is a problem uh, there. But, but again, we're always talking about the same relative percentages, right? Most people seem to be able to use this substance without huge difficulties, although, again, there's a subset of people that don't. All right, I think we're going to have to call it at that point. We've hit our mark. Um, so thank you all so much for coming and uh, wonderful questions. And uh, give our uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.